and want to welcome everybody to the Hand Fellowship Virtual Debates. I believe this is our ninth one of the year. And for those that are new to the debates, we started this just over a year ago, uh, just looking for ways of enhancing education for fellows across the country. It's really turned into a really great collaboration from different institutions. We're still kind of modeled after the Mayo Clinic, Stanford, U of Chicago, who were really gracious in sharing their Zoom links and lectures and didactics throughout the country. So thought it's a way of really expanding on that. It started about eight to 10 programs. And over time, we really tried to be as inclusive as possible. So again, for those that are new to the program, the overall format is we have a faculty moderator who leads the debate between handfelds from across the country who are mentored by their faculty, followed by a faculty Q&A discussion. So we're really excited to uh, have today's session on DRAG arthritis moderated by Dr. Hanel, who is my colleague here at University of Washington at Harborview Medical Center. And we certainly do have a cage match today between five different institutions. So we're gonna be well represented across the country, University of Washington, Indiana Hand to Shoulder, Louisville Kleiner Institute, Stanford, and University of Rochester. We're gonna run the full gamut on treatment options, looking at calamari interposition, a osteotomy ligament reconstruction, trying to preserve the DRAJ as much as possible, salva compongi, Achilles interposition, and a DRAJ prosthesis. And really want to save this on your calendar. So we have two more debates lined up for the rest of the calendar year, the academic year. On May 20th, we're going to be looking at forum non-unions and comparing a traditional bone grafting technique with masculine versus a vascularized fibula in an MFC. And we have a kind of a double debate coming up on June 10, looking at pediatric hand with two topics of syndactyly and looking at opponent's plasty for hypoplastic thumb. And for those of you that have not had a chance to check out Hand E for the Hand Fellows, uh, this was really the work of Dr. Hammer and taken over by Dr. Kekar this past year. Just an amazing amount of content on surgical videos and lectures and PowerPoints. And also all the virtual debate lectures are recorded and available on Hand E typically a couple of days after the debates. And from that, I will hand it off to Dr. Hanel. Well, so am I on, Jerry? Jerry, you're muted. Yeah, Doug, it looks like you're yeah, on. Doug, so if you have the share screen button on your screen, it's, you could take over the PowerPoint from there. Where did it go? I would love to. Doug, it should be at the very bottom. It's a green button. Yeah, I know. No, where is it? Huh? Escape? I assume right here. Are you on a kind of a view, maybe view gallery or kind of an odd viewing screen there, Doug? What do you think? Let's go up. Yeah, well, there. There we go. PowerPoint. Share that. Am I on? There you go. Yeah. All right. Am I on? Yeah. Cool. We'll start with this somewhere at the very beginning or somewhere on the zoom. Okay. So, sorry, I, uh, it takes obviously a fellow to get me through my Zoom meetings and such. Thank you, Gabby. So we're going to talk about reconstructing the distal radial ulnar joint. And for those of you that, that like science, this is the first photograph of a black hole. It's a mysterious place in space where nothing, not even light, can escape, ultimately warping space and time. 
and astronomers have long observed but not understood the effects of the surroundings of this phenomena. And we can put in the DRUJ and we can re replace astronomers for hand surgeries. And I think that it really has become a, a mystery for me. And it is one of those things where I seem to learn more about what I don't know than what I do know every time that I delve into this subject. I would like to, to leave you, and especially the fellows and residents that are watching this, um, to do three things, to read three articles. The first of which is an article that's a review article, now almost 20 years old, um, on Bill Kleinman's review of the distal radio owner joint and his 25 year experience with that. Um, th this particular article has presented probably one of the most copied illustrations on distal radio ulnar joints uh, done by Gary Schnitz and shown here and, and defines the triangular fibrocartilage complex as well as the superficial and deep ligamentous stabilizers of the distal radio ulnar joint. I think one of the things that it really does do is it demonstrates to us how incongruous the skeleton is. Uh, especially the distal radial ulnar joint and the relationship between the ulnar head and the sacral notch. It's an incongruous articular surface. It's uh, got a misshaped uh, sigmoid notch, both uh, in a coronal and sagittal section, and it has variable length, which makes it very confusing to try to deal with. One thing that it did demonstrate and has demonstrated well in this article is that in addition to the triangular fibrocartilage complex, there is a, a, a group of ligaments and ligamentous structures that are referred to as the deep or ligamentum subcruentum. And if you look up the Latin definition of subcruentum, it is meaning underneath the vessels and underneath the vascular uh, vasculature that is in the periphery of the triangular fibrocartilage complex. Uh, typically named uh, by uh, Bill Kleinman. But what it does show is that there is a superficial group of fibers that runs from the ulnar styloid onto the insertion of the radius. And then there's a deep or a, a deeper layer, the deep ligamentum subcruinum that runs from the fovea. And the, these two structures actually lead to some confusion in how they actually work. One of the, uh, the analogies, and one of the analogies that I think is very, very helpful is, is the analogy of the buckboard. And in this, and in the buckboard analogy, the rider represents the ulnar styloid and ulnar phobia, the horses are the radius, and the broad ligament can direct all four horses or the, the the wrist and the distal radial ulnar joint um, in, in consort. As it does this, there are superficial fibers that become taut in supination or deep fibers that become loose. And in the research that was done on this and the initial research that was done on the distal radial ulnar joint, Ekenstam, Off Ekenstam and Hager demonstrated that in, super, in pronation, the proximal radial ulnar joint was tight, whereas Schwind and the Krista uh, demonstrated just the opposite. And in doing that, and I'm looking at the analogy, go, well, what is it? It's got to be one or the other. And in 1994, Hager came to the solution that these two opposing studies or opposing findings were really papers looking at two different things. And I think the summary, if you're trying to memorize this or think about it, is just remember that in supination, the superficial DRUJ fibers, that are the dorsal radio ulnar joint fibers are tight and the deep ones are loose. And just the opposite occurs in pronation. The second paper that I think is really, really helpful and extremely important in what we're doing is a paper that was done by Lees and, and Lewis Shecker. 
that demonstrated that the resting x-ray that we see in the lower left-hand corner is demonstrates a space between the radius and the ulna that really doesn't exist in real life. And if you hold a one, two pound weight and take a radiograph as demonstrated in the position in the upper right corner, you will see the impingement that has become increasingly important. And one of the things that happens with this is that it begs the question of what happens to the axis of the forearm, the normal axis that goes from the, the neck or head of the, of the radius to the styloid process of the ulna, what happens to it when we resect that ulnar head and what happens in our rotation? Finally, and the third article that I think everyone should read is this four-leaf clover treatment algorithm that is written by Sanjay Kakar and Mark Garcia Elias, and two of the, the, the smartest and biggest brains in, in distal radial or joint pathology and treatment. And what they did is they said that for the most part, you can divide the pathology of the distal radial ulnar joint into three, excuse me, into four lenses that overlap. Bony deformities, cartilage defects, triangular fibro cartilage complex injuries, and an unstable ECU. And this injuries to this area can occur in singular or in combination. And as an example of this, they demonstrated a, that, that this malunion of this distal radius fracture was just that. It was just a bony injury, and the only thing that they needed to treat in this particular patient was the bony deformity. Whereas in this case, a case that looks a lot like Marco Rizzo cases, or he, he demonstrated in his diagnosis that not only was there bony injury, but there was a repairable triangular fibrocartilage complex injury, and the treatment of that was so directed. So you can have one or all four pathology. And in today, and in our debates, we'll find that we have mostly cartilage defects that we're dealing with, triangular fibrocartilage injuries, and bone defects and bone deformity that are going to be directed by the argument for reconstruction. And I don't think that these reconstructions are exclusive of each other, but represent a compendium of approaches to this particular part, this particular problem. And to that end, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the first discussion uh, by team Nicholas uh, Iannuzzi. Guy Iannuzzi is my, one of my partners here at the University of Washington. So I'll turn the screen over to him. Thank you. Thanks. I think um, Abby is our hand fellow and he'll be presenting uh, on the save the head and calamari into position uh, for distal radial ulnar joint uh, pathology. Thanks, Dr. Ianuzzi. So uh, like you said, I'm presenting on save the head and calamari into position. My name is uh, Abby Bosch. I'm at the University of Washington. Dr. Ianuzzi is my mentor. It's almost like Dr. Hennel set me up with this picture, uh, which I've also used uh, as many others have. The distal radial ulnar joint has a complex anatomy and it has minimal osseous constraint. It really relies on an interplay between bony and soft tissue skeletal stability that includes the, that includes the DRUJ ligaments, dynamic stabilizers and the joint capsule. And uh, Almquist in 1992 commented that the ability to supinate and pronate the forearm is possibly as significant as brain size and the opposable thumb in the context of human evolution. And when problems in the DRUJ occur, the treatment is often challenging. This can include in settings of DRUJ arthritis, ulnocarpal impaction, and it's even compounded in the setting of DRUJ instability. So what are the DRUJ treatment options? And broadly, we can break them down into options that involve implants, options that don't involve implants, um, or options that involve partial fusions. So here I've broken it down simply into resection arthroplasty, such as using an inner position or not, um, with stabilization, arthrodesis, such as a soft capongi, or implant arthroplasty, with either an ulnar head replacement or a semi-constrained DRUJ arthroplasty. 
with all of these options, is there really a need for another option to be added to this group? And I'm going to argue in this case that yes, there is an there is a reason uh, for preserving the ulnar head and doing a columnar or meniscal interposition, mostly because it doesn't obviate the need um, or the option to do any of these other procedures. But in order to establish that there's a need for yet another new procedure, I thought it might be helpful to go over what the prior procedures are and potential shortcomings and what the opportunity is for a new procedure. So with resection arthroplasty used with or without an interposition and stabilization, the main patients generally do well, but we know that in 70 to 80% of patients, there is stump instability. And while not all uh, impingement is symptomatic, when it is symptomatic, it is quite painful for the patient. And we know that there are options for uh, revision reconstruction or opportunities to avoid painful impingements, such as the Achilles allograft interposition that was described by Dr. Satirianos in Pittsburgh. But even this isn't uh, a fully satisfactory and fully foolproof uh, treatment. It's great for maintaining separation between the distal ulnar stump and the radial shaft um, to treat ulnar impingement, but it doesn't necessarily address fuller ulnar instability of the ulnar stump. And in this setting, some have proposed tenodesis using the FCU or ECU for stabilization. So if options that don't involve implants uh, aren't perfect, well, what about options that do? And if we look first at ulnar head arthroplasty, the whole reason for doing this is to maintain the distal radial ulnar joint by replacing the ulnar head and maintaining contact with the sigmoid notch. If we include an ulnar head, we prevent ulnar impingement and radial ulnar convergence. But in this nice paper from the Mayo Clinic in 47 patients with 83% survival, 30% of these patients still required additional surgery. Eight of them had to be revised um, and four required soft tissue stabilization. And it was noted that there was a 50% failure rate in patients who had a flat sigmoid notch. So if owner head replacement alone isn't the solution, another great solution is the semi-constrained DRUJ arthroplasty that was proposed by Dr. Shecker and really developed by him. But again, while this does address a lot of the shortcomings of the other options, 29% uh, of patients in a, uh, still have complications that require surgery that was done in the study here. And especially in young patients, this implant does come with a 20 to 25 pound weightlifting restriction. So of all these DRUJ treatment options, we see that none of them is truly quite perfect. All of them have some type of a limitation. So in recent history, people have proposed, well, perhaps there's a hybrid option between options that include implants versus not and soft tissue stabilization versus not. And one such hybrid solution is the partial ulnar head replacement with sigmoid notch resurfacing um, using a meniscal allograft or a calamari type procedure. That was also described by um, Dr. Kakar and others at Mayo. And in this case, the calamari is essentially interposed as a new meniscus uh, within the sigmoid notch and the ulnar head is replaced using an ulnar head replacement. Typical x-rays look like this. And the, the reasoning behind it is that the calamari now acts as a labrum of the DRUJ, essentially cushioning between the ulnar head and the sigmoid notch and hopefully accounting for the failure rates associated with the flat sigmoid notch by providing additional soft tissue stabilization and providing additional offset of the implant. But again, if we think back to the principle of all these operations, we realize that the real essence of the DRUJ is a dynamic balance between bony stability and soft tissue stability. And as we resect bone, we can view this as a form of currency and it essentially limits our further options. So as much as we can to preserve bone, those options are preferred. And in this case, our hybrid option that I'm proposing here is a save the head calamari interposition, which I think is particularly helpful in young patients uh, and in those whom we predict or expect to eventually require a revision operation or another operation to treat their DRUJ problems. A classic example of this is this patient who was treated here. She's an 18-year-old female who had wrist pain. She had a year history of pain over the DRUJ, had failed non-operative treatment with NSAIDs and bracing, had tried cortisone injections, and still had crepitus and instability at the DRUJ. She was ulnar negative, had mild DRUJ arthritis, and on MRI, she had chondromalacia of the sigmoid notch with a TFCC tear on the radial side. She was treated here uh, with a save the head uh, calamari uh, interposition. And in this case, again, the calamari was used as a cushion interposition for the ulnar head and the sigmoid notch, recreating a labrum to seat the native ulnar head um, and allowing for preservation of all of her native bone. At six weeks post-op, she had decreased pain good range of motion and no longer had any complaints of DRUJ instability. 
So if we break down all of these options into a table, we realize that treating these patients is hard and difficult. No great, no, no option is without its limitations or its drawbacks. And essentially we're compromising between increasing bone loss, decreasing soft tissue stability. And we're also including what the patient's demand is. But going through all of this, I would argue that a calamari procedure without a hemiarthroplasty by saving the ulnar head is an option that is a good equal ground and a good hybrid option. It preserves all of the patient's native bone stock, allowing for future revision operations. It also allows for any of the other procedures that we're gonna talk about today. And I think it's an excellent option for young patients. So I just wanted to thank uh, my other mentors, Dr. Wong, uh, who worked with some of the slides, Dr. Anuzi, Dr. Hanel, uh, just taught me a ton, and my co-fellows who also helped uh, with all of this. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you to go a couple slides back, if you would. Because in your slide, you've got three suture anchors, one volar, middle, and dorsal. Is that, did you do this procedure through one approach or through a volar and dorsal approach? Uh, a volar approach, uh, sorry, a dorsal approach, and then a small volar portal uh, incision that's described in this picture here. This credit goes to my co-fellow, Steve Zoller and Dr. Wong, um, who drew this picture and and have started using this approach. Great. Well, thank you very much. Now we're going to discuss osteotomy and ligamentous reconstruction from uh, the Louisville, uh, University of Louisville, and that's Dr. Uh, Huey Tien and Louis Shecker. Hey, good evening. Uh, Huey Tien here. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this. And while Monica is uploading and share the screen, I want to kind of um, say hi to everyone. So what I always tell my fellow is uh, why we choose this procedure uh, or any kind of procedure is a simple, effective, low complication. So after Dr. Uh, Monica Picacci introduced this procedure, probably you can abandon everything else. So this is what the debate is all about. Okay, so Monica, are you ready? Uh, Dr. Picacci is one of our uh, fellows in the Kranner Institute. Uh, she is from Philippines. Uh, she will be our uh, second year fellow uh, this coming year. Hi. <clears throat> All right, good evening, everybody. Um, again, I'm Monica Picacha. I'm one of the fellows at um, Kleiner Institute, and I'm here to talk about um, managing DRUG arthritis using an osteotomy with or without a ligament reconstruction because nothing beats the real thing. All right, so, all right. The distal radio ulnar joint is responsible for smooth and painless forearm range of motion, as well as providing support during weight bearing. And this joint holds much responsibility in stabilizing the wrist when carrying loads, but unfortunately, it's not the most stable joint. Biomechanical studies performed demonstrate the large difference in the radius of curvature between the ulnar head and the sigmoid notch, making this joint highly dependent on soft tissues for its inherent stability. Sorry. Um, it's this insufficiency in the DRUJ um, that makes it a common side of arthritis. So it's important to note the most common causes of DRUJ arthritis because different etiologies can be offered different forms of treatment. Post-traumatic uh, post changes and malunion is the most common cause of DRUJ arthritis. This may result from initial instability leading to arthritis or incongruence of the joint itself from the onset of injury. Inflammatory and or degenerative forms follow in frequency for causes of DRUG arthritis and usually arise in adulthood. On the other hand, congenital deformities like madelungs are the third cause and in this subset, patient's early identification and diagnosis is key. Still, regardless of the cause and probably what matters more to your patients is how much, of their, how much their hand surgeon is going to alleviate their symptoms and restore function. They basically want a pain-free, mobile, strong, and functional wrist. So one of my mentors for this debate was Dr. Louis Shecker, and he recently gave a lecture to the Kleinert Fellows regarding the technique for his very own DRUJ prosthesis. And as much as he wanted to share the success of this prosthesis, um, he never fails to talk about how not only is it important 
to know um, how to use it, but when to use it. So something he said was that the mark of a good surgeon is not only knowing how to operate, you can teach a monkey how to operate and they may learn how to do a surgery flawlessly, but what differentiates you from a monkey is that you should know when a specific surgery is warranted. With that being said, I'd like to offer everyone osteotomies of either the radius and or the ulna with or without ligament reconstruction for the treatment of DRUG arthritis. The benefits of this procedure are that it aims to restore joint congruency, directly solving the arthritic issue. It addresses the patient's concern, which are mainly pain with some form of instability. It does not compromise the patient's ability to lift heavy objects or grip tightly once osteotomies have healed. It preserves the native bone of the patient and it burns no bridges in, cases for, in case further procedures are needed in the future. So this image clearly depicts um, what an ulnar shortening can do. Here we see realignment of the articular surface in the DRUJ, and that realignment allows better distribution of load passing through the joint. So here, the ulnar shortening helps to realign the um, articulating surface, changing the contact area to allow better distribution of loads. So this procedure is for individuals who present with localized pain in the DRUJ. Radiographs and history generally reveal previous trauma as the cause of incongruency in the joint. Signs of congenital malformations are also candidates for an osteotomy, though a different type would be done. It is not indicated in advanced osteoarthritic cases where all cartilage within the DRUJ is lost. I'd like to present some cases where osteotomies for early DRUJ is warranted. Here we have a 30-year-old male complaining of right ulnar sided wrist pain. He admits to having multiple wrist injuries in the past, which would cause pain. Initially, the pain would resolve with rest, but at, un at an unrecalled point, pain, be pain became persistent. Um, this patient comes to you seeking second opinion. And um, sorry, this patient comes to you seeking second opinion. And he was previously managed with injections, um, which would only provide temporary relief. And when asked more about um, how he could get some temporary relief, basically his previous doctor said, just wait a while, wait for the arthritis to get bad and then surgery could be an option. So it's these patients who are good candidates for um, the procedures we are offering. Um, this is a case where the patient presents with early symptomatic DRUG arthritis, resistant to conservative management. And um, that's kind of the type of patient we want for this type of procedure. So this case can be managed with an ulnar, sh ulnar shortening osteotomy, which changes the uh, area of contact in the DRUJ. Um, it adjusts and transfers the loaded surface area to one where more abundant cartilage is present. And it's an opportunity for surgeons to save the joint, save the native bone, retighten uh, re any soft tissue laxity and instability, and give a usually younger patient a functional pain-free DRUJ with a prolonged lifespan. At this point, I'd like to briefly demonstrate how sometimes ligament instability contributes to arthritis and stress that, um, and stress that um, reconstructing these soft tissues can prevent OA progression. So falls, uh, most falls occur uh, with a patient falling on a pronated wrist. And pronation and axial load apply, um, applies a large amount of stress on dorsal radio ulnar ligaments, uh, potentially causing tears, uh, sorry, potentially causing tears. Um, unfortunately, but also unfortunately, the peripheral vascularity in these zones are quite abundant, giving the area healing potential, which often uh, occurs with a loose ligament, ultimately producing instability. So this extra few millimeters of translation within the DRUJ is a potential cause of increased pressure on surface contact between the sigmoid notch and the ulnar head. And this laxity is sometimes corrected by ulnar shortening, but in cases where instability persists, after shortening, we do recommend ligament reconstruction. Um, scenario number two is a case of a 61-year-old male seeking consult for persistent ulnar-sided wrist pain again, um, who previously underwent conservative management in the past for a distal radius fracture. The x-ray on your right um, demonstrates a mismatch in the DRUJ with beginning signs of sclerosis at the sigmoid notch. And this patient was once more treated with an ulnar shortening osteotomy, which helped relieve his symptoms. Um, Dr. Shecker and Severo conducted a prospective study to evaluate the outcomes of ulnar shortening when used for DRUJ arthritis. And um, in his paper, subjects were assessed in terms of wrist rating scores, functional status, range of motion, and grip. And of the 32 patients who were enrolled, 
Outcomes were as follows, yielding about 30, 18 of 32 patients with good to excellent results. Um, for the final case, I'd like to show you, this is a case of a 68-year-old female who came in for pain on the ulnar side of the wrist again with no prior trauma. Incidentally, on x-ray, um, there were findings of LT coalition as well as DRUJOA. Um, her arthritis was a little more advanced, but we still indicated her for an ulnar shortening osteotomy and possible ligament reconstruction. Postoperatively, she demonstrated improvement in pain on range of motion and gripping, and postoperative x-rays do show that the contact surface in the DRUJ were adjusted and bone spurs were no longer within the articulating surface. Um, here's a paper I just wanted to add. Um, it basically supports performing corrective osteotomies in the radius on this, uh, for this cases in young patients who have distal radio ulnar joint malunion and instability. So osteotomies were done for these cases, either dorsal, volar, distal, proximal, depending on the type of deformity, uh, cause, and surgeon preference. And postoperatively, they were able to get all their patients back to pre-injury or pre-pain functional status. So basically, in summary, um, key points would be to be proactive, treat early osteoarthritis early, treat cases that are resistant to non-surgical management promptly to avoid progression of the arthritis, give your um, younger patients a chance to have a pain-free wrist rather than allowing progression in la and later management, preserve the native bone whenever you can, um, and that corrective osteotomies are effective in properly indicated individuals. Ligament reconstruction can address any remaining instability if there is any. And corrective osteotomies, just like the prior procedure, don't burn any bridges. Further treatment down the line is still an option. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We, at the end of all the discussions, we will discuss this paper with, with one of the questions being is osteotomy versus reconstruction or arthroscopy versus reconstruction. Is that an and or and or procedure? Um, and we will discuss it at the uh, end of the presentation. All right. Uh, now we are going to present Sabic Punji procedure as a viable option for the treatment of the unstable and arthritic distal radiolar joint with Jeff Yao, Stanford. Who's your who's your fellow, Jeff? We got our stellar fellow Eugene Park. It is a plastics residency at Northwestern and now is doing an outstanding job for us here at Stanford. Eugene. All right. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much for this opportunity to share um, our opinion on the um, best treatment for DRUG arthritis, which uh, we will argue is the Save Kapanji. Uh, please let me know if there's any problems with the slides. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Eugene Park. My mentor is Dr. Jeff Yao, and um, we're here at Stanford. Um, the previous presenters have talked a lot about the background of DRUG arthritis um, as well as instability. And there are many different ways of managing this problem. The ones that have really stood the test of time and have been around for the longest are distal ulnar head resection, such as the Darrow or Bowers, as well as a creation of a DRUG arthrodesis with a uh, concomitant ulnar pseudoarthrosis, also known as a Salve Kapanji. The, um, the younger uh, candidates for treatment of this condition uh, are insertion of the allograft interposition, um, as has been presented before, as well as a prosthetic arthroplasty. Um, but amongst these, <clears throat> I would argue uh, that the Salve Kapanji is the most versatile and probably the most uh, uh, reliable in terms of pain relief for these patients. So what are the advantages of doing a Sabe Kapanji? Well, first, it maintains native anatomy. By preserving the ulnar head, you have preservation of the not only the distal radial ulnar joint, uh, but also the ulnar carpal ligaments, which are going to provide um, as close to a native anatomy and uh, ligament of support as you can. It prevents ulnar translocation of the carpus, has been shown, uh, which has been shown in um, various uh, series uh, in the literature. The pain relief is very reliable. In some series, this is up to 100%, and it allows simultaneous correction of ulnar variants. Uh, other uh, authors have shown that it results in increased uh, grips, uh, improved grip strength, as well as higher rates of return to the patient's original profession compared to other procedures. Um, and like I said, it's a very versatile procedure, which really could be uh, applied to uh, almost the whole gamut of uh, DRUJ arthritis um, 
uh, causes. Uh, and compared to the other um, treatments that are being presented today, I would argue that one of the strong benefits is the low cost, the proven longevity of this procedure, as well as the minimal implant related morbidity. Uh, this is a series out of Beth Israel, which I believe is one of the most robust uh, data sets out there looking at Save Kapanji outcomes. The group reviewed 57 patients over a 10-year period, and they looked at patient-reported outcomes using the Quick Dash um, uh, instrument, and this was recorded over various um, time lengths. They looked at risk range of motion as well, as well as um, radiographic measurements and complications. And what they found is that uh, very consistently, um, at each interval, the patients had improving patient reported outcomes with quick dash scores uh, decreasing over the course of um, the first uh, 12 months. And at follow up, uh, final follow up, this quick dash score had decreased from an average of 52 to an average of 30. What they found with range of motion is that uh, supination is greatly improved to a um, significant value. And uh, this is what is uh, usually most heavily impacted in the RUJ arthritis. So, this is a significant finding. And um, it's indicated for uh, various uh, um, types of arthritis, including inflammatory arthritis, as well as osteoarthritis, as you see on the right. Wow. Um, and what they found is an ability to correct uh, ulnar variants with improvement um, from the mean preoperative to postoperative values. Um, there were complications associated with the series, 21%, four required removal of hardware, for required revision osteotomy for a uh, reossification of the pseudoarthrosis, which I would argue is probably uh, the most significant complication. Um, but they also included other surgical side incidences such as cellulitis and persistent pain, which leads to that higher number. There was a more recent series out of the Mayo Clinic where they looked at 35 patients who underwent SK with a minimum of one year follow-up. And here they had 100% union rates, improved post-operative grip strength. Everybody maintained um, their range of motion and there was only a 11.3% uh, rate of major complications. So in terms of technique for the Save Kapanji, um, the distal ulna is approached uh, through the uh, fifth extensor compartment. After retracting the EDM radially, uh, you have access to the distal, radio, uh, distal ulna by going through the capsule. The DRUJ is burred such that all of the cartilage is removed and the um, cancellous bone is presented uh, to allow for a good union. At this point, the one centimeter wafer of the um, ulna is resected in order to create a pseudoarthrosis. Two uh, K wires are introduced across the DRUJ, which are then replaced with headless compression screws. And the proximal stump can be stabilized either using the EDM or the pronator quadratus. So this is a sample patient um, from our uh, institution where the patient developed DRUJ arthritis following a distal radius malunion. And you could see on the right side in the post-operative radiographs that the patient not only had um, good union of the savic capanji procedure, as well as correction of the uh, malunion, um, but a correction of the uh, ulnar uh, variants as well. So very versatile uh, way to address multiple complaints with one procedure. So I'd like to talk a little bit about alternatives to this. And I know we're not talking about the DARA today, but why is the savic capanji better? Well, the DARA is limited to older, lower demand patients. There's variable le levels of anatomy distortion based on how much you resect. There is decreased grip strength, at least compared to the SAVE. And there is the potential for ulnar carpal translocation. And the high rates of proximal radial ulnar imp impingement have been found in multiple studies. How about uh, compared to allograft interposition, such as the calamari? Well, we all know that any kind of processed allograft is very expensive, uh, as well as um, introduces an inflammatory element. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen cases where you introduce an allograft and it produces a lot of uh, fluid accumulation as well as prolonged edema in the surgical site. Um, as well, uh, while we do have nice long-term outcomes for the last the SA, in July, yeah, you saw that. <clears throat> um, we don't have as uh, long-term outcomes for the allograft interposition. Um, and usually this is uh, chosen as a salvage procedure when other DREJ procedures are not successful. How about the arthroplasty? Well, when you introduce a metallic prosthesis, again, you have the potential for major complications and some series, one of which was presented in a previous presentation, reported up to a 44% complication rate with a 10% hardware removal requirement. Plus, it's very costly. Personally, I was unable to find the cost of the prosthesis uh, looking just online, but I'm sure it's upwards of uh, four to five figures. 
And again, we lack the long-term follow-up data we have for the um, SK. Um, to be transparent, there are limitations to the SK as well. Uh, probably the most critical one is the risk of um, non-union at the arthrodesis site, as well as the risk of re-ossification at the pseudoarthrosis site, uh, which has been found to be around um, 7%. There is some risk of hardware complications, but it's just uh, compression screws, so this can be removed um, and is less costly when you have complications. And um, there is uh, a little bit of increased technical complex complexity when you compare to just the ulnar head resection. So in summary, uh, the SK is a very versatile treatment for DRUG arthritis of most indications. Uh, it provides increased grip strength compared to just uh, regular ulnar head uh, resection, and it protects against ulnar head translocation, and it has decreased risk of complications compared to some of these newer unproven methods of treating DRE jar arthritis. Um, so I would choose Isavik Hapanji in most indications for its reliability in pain relief, as well as its longstanding track record of success. Thank you very much. Thank you for a well-presented argument for Save Kapunje. Now we're going to have the Indiana Hand a Shoulder Center represented by the boss, Jeff Greenberg, and uh, his uh, appointed fellow, Jeff. Thanks, everybody. With the fourth pick, <laughs> the Indiana Hand Center will present Pete Henning, who's going to present our experience and bias with uh, Achilles interposition arthroplasty. Pete comes to Indiana from the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. He's doing a great job with us. So take it away, Pete. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so like Dr. Greenberg said with that kind introduction, my name is Pete Henning. I'm one of the fellows here at uh, Indiana. I just wanted to thank Dr. Greenberg for his help with this talk. Um, give me some slides and then the rest of the fellows and staff here that uh, make these uh, meetings and uh, Zoom conferences happen. So just to quickly talk about DOJ arthritis again, it's been said before. Um, that it really comes in many different flavors ranging from the congenital Madelung's cases to post-traumatic degenerative cases and the inflammatory arthropathies such as the rheumatoid patients. Uh, a variety of treatment options exist, but uh, really one must take into account a number of factors, including age of the patient, activity level, the deformity, uh, ligamentous incompetence, uh, prior surgeries, uh, and determining really which treatment option uh, to best use. <clears throat> I want to bring this uh, picture up, not to scare everyone with physics, but to again, uh, stress the importance that the uh, distal radial joint is a load-bearing articulation. It serves as the fulcrum uh, through which the uh, radius carpus and hand uh, unit is supported. Uh, it's an important concept to keep in mind as we really talk about these uh, treatments and their associated complications. So first thing in the spirit of competition, I wanted to talk about uh, what not to do. Uh, Eugene just did a great job talking about the, the SK. Um, so I'll try to be kind. It was first described in the 1930s, uh, but later popularized in the 1990s by Telesnik. Uh, the good we all just heard about, it preserves the distal ulna. It uh, <clears throat> keeps the ulnar carpal uh, platform to support uh, the carpus, and it also uh, keeps soft tissues, uh, including the TFCC and distal radial ulnar ligaments. It also accomplishes the goal of fusing the, the painful joint and allows uh, motion through the uh, pseudoarthrosis site. The bad comes into play um, as in any uh, ablative um, treatment, uh, and that comes as impingement. Uh, impingement rates can range from 20 to 40 percent, as uh, shown by uh, Dr. Fernandez. You can also have uh, ulnar stump instability and winging. We are introducing hardware, uh, although it's been modified and recent years with use of headless compression screws, but uh, adding hardware always uh, brings complications. But as also uh, just presented, uh, you can have, have the uh, major complication of uh, ossification of your pseudoarthrosis site requiring reoperation. Next is the Calamari procedure. 
it's a new procedure and it's shown uh, promising early results in regards to pain and functional improvements. Uh, by adding that uh, buffer of tissue, the authors claim that uh, it is they're increasing uh, the stability at the distal uh, radial ulnar joint and also claim by uh, distributing the forces uh, from their implant or as we heard before from the native on their head, it can prevent uh, chondrolysis and further degeneration. The uh, bad is again that it's an unproven. Uh, the two studies uh, looking at the implant version of the calamari procedure uh, are a total of nine patients with only a 26 month mean follow up. In those uh, nine patients, they had a 22% pre operation rate, uh, but that was due to uh, stiffness at the DRUJ after their capsulotomies. If you do use an implant, rather than save the head, you uh, again inherit all the risks that are associated with implants. And then also, as was uh, talked about before, the authors um, had previously compared um, their uh, meniscal allograft to uh, data involved in the uh, shoulder. Uh, but uh, given the function of the DRUJ as a load-bearing uh, joint of upper extremity, I think it, uh, it may be a better idea to look at um, some of the knee meniscal allograft transplantation. Looking at the Journal of Sports Medicine, um, their midterm results showed a, a pretty good midterm uh, survival at five to 10 years, but then there was a sharp uh, drop off uh, greater than 10 years. And if we can extrapolate this data uh, to the wrist, uh, that may be a little concerning. Lastly, uh, in a competition to uh, our uh, talk on the uh, allograft inner position is the uh, Schecker, the semi-constrained uh, distal radial ulnar joint arthroplasty. It uh, has a lot of good associated with it in that it recreates the fulcrum and allows load transmission and load bearing. Um, it uh, addresses issues of instability and ligament incompetence by uh, uh, its semi-constrained uh, nature. It's uh, effective in both primary and revision cases and it uh, is versatile to treat a number of different pathologies. The bad things associated with the Shecker come uh, into play in uh, two studies, one by uh, Dr. Hannell's group and one by the uh, Mayo group. Um, they showed uh, anywhere from a 16% uh, to 29% um, complication rate requiring uh, reoperations. Of note, they did say that uh, their uh, complications improved uh, though with time and, and learning the technique. Additionally, as was mentioned before, is uh, the lifting restriction that com comes with uh, this implant. And this is a, a picture of a, a major complication after uh, the Schecker arthroplasty. And um, it really has to make you think of uh, down the road, what would you do uh, if you have a major complication like this? And the most dreaded outcome in any uh, DRUJ pathology is uh, ultimately, that one bone form, which can be a real option uh, with these major complications. So, uh, presenting our tech, our preferred technique, it's the Achilles allograft interposition, uh, described by Dr. Soterianos and also uh, Dr. Greenberg. Looking at uh, Dr. Soterianos' uh, most recent paper on his uh, uh, series, he uh, evaluated 26 patients. The mean age was about 43 years old, and they had an average of two prior procedures uh, prior to the allograft interposition. They had a good mean follow-up of about 79 months. Uh, they demonstrate uh, significant improvements in pain, uh, form rotation and grip strength, as well as uh, patient reported outcomes. And uh, to specifically note, they had no infections or foreign body reactions. To be completely transparent though, they did have a complication. Uh, the one uh, complication that they noted in their paper uh, was and actually the first patient uh, that uh, this procedure was performed on by Dr. Satirianos, uh, this uh, patient was also a workers comp patient. So uh, take that in mind. This patient had uh, continued mechanical symptoms of uh, clicking and grinding and pain, uh, which they contributed to an insufficient allograft bulk. Also um, discussed as a, another possible complication, but uh, it has, since it has remained asymptomatic is this uh, radiographic radiographic evidence of uh, ulnar scalloping. They did note that they have not had any fractures and this does not uh, affect to seem, uh, seem to affect uh, patients' function or pain levels. 
another paper um, that deals with uh, some uh, failures of the uh, allograft interposition. Uh, this was a uh, study done at three different in institutions. They uh, found seven patients uh, that had undergone an Achilles interposition um, that had gone on to failure. Uh, looking at their data, they did find a, quite an early failure at five months. And also, um, one single surgeon uh, from this paper uh, contributed four out of the seven failures. Uh, so that uh, makes you wonder if this is more of a, a technique problem uh, rather than a procedure problem. Uh, all these patients were revised uh, to the Schecker arthroplasty and were reported to do well. So just uh, the uh, technique pearls uh, about the procedure. Uh, the first step is to get a good exposure. Uh, use previous incisions if they're there. Uh, you have to subperiostally dissect uh, the distal ulna at your area of impingement. And then you also have to get to the ulnar aspect of the radius, uh, which means taking down uh, some of the interosseous membrane. The next step is to uh, place three to four uh, mini suture anchors in a unicortical fashion into the uh, ulnar aspect of the radius. Uh, these suture anchors um, are then uh, threaded through the bulk allograft, uh, which is uh, bundled and uh, secured. The sutures pass through the allograft and then are passed uh, through the ulna through bone tunnels. After uh, doing this, it is important um, to evaluate uh, the um, forearm pronation and supination uh, to ensure that uh, you have an allograft size and how you would uh, detect that is you would ensure that you have no clicking or grinding and just smooth range of motion. After you confirm that, uh, you can, Dr. Greenberg's modification is to uh, tuck the remaining tail of the uh, allograft over the uh, distal ulnar stump to uh, uh, provide some added stability. So in summary, um, we think the Achilles interposition allograft is uh, a very good option uh, in some primary patients, such as young laborers, because uh, we believe that there's uh, no weightlifting restrictions uh, and good long-term results, which are, are supported by clinical evidence. It avoids a lot of the implant-related uh, concerns that come with the other arthroplasties, such as loosening, particulate wear, uh, longevity, uh, revision, and cost. Uh, you can really tailor it to the individual patient and their anatomy, and uh, it can be easily revised if necessary, uh, but hopefully uh, that's not the case. I just wanted to thank everybody for allowing me to talk, and I'll leave that slide up there. Thank you, Peter. Um, can we have the last uh, lecture, and that's going to be from the University of Rochester, Warren Hammert, who are you introducing? Uh, thanks, Doug. I appreciate you letting us go last so we can clean up all the mistakes that have been made previously. Very nice to uh, end it this way. So I'm going to introduce our uh, current hand fellow. It's Leland Gossett, who has uh, done a phenomenal job. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the semi-constrained DRUJ implant. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leland Gossett from the University of Rochester. Um, today talking about the semi-constrained DRUJ arthroplasty. Um, my mentor is Dr. Warren Hammert, and uh, thank you to him as well as the rest of my faculty here and uh, nationally at the ASSH. So the problem, uh, DRUJ arthritis is a difficult situation to manage, and this is highlighted by a patient of ours. She's 36 year old, she's young, and she wants to be active both at work and at play. And she's held back by pain in this DRUJ, which is arthritic um, after uh, uh, post-traumatic uh, changes in her DRUJ um, and a multiply operated wrist. So what does she need? She clearly needs pain relief and she needs a stable joint that is mobile through a functional range of motion and able to bear load throughout that range of motion. And there's a lot of options to uh, try to give this to her, but as any Chicago Bears fan knows on draft night, sometimes when you have a lot of options, it means you just have no answers. So uh, going through some of these options, uh, first of all, the DARA, uh, people have been cutting out the all in their head since this was a Tesla. And uh, clearly it uh, can be helpful in some patients where it has a lot of problems, including uh, radio ulnar convergence, ulnar stump instability, um, carpal instability, and extensor tendon pathology. So perhaps there's room to accept a little bit of innovation here. How about the Soviet Kampanji? Um, 
clearly it's different than Adara, uh, but perhaps we're just trading one issue for another. So we've introduced new complications, including uh, non-union um, pseudo and uh, calcification of the pseudoarthrosis site, as well as hardware complications, as well as continuing to have the same issues of um, radio ulnar impingement, uh, which may be painful for patients. L-graft interposition, certainly a modification of the, the DARA technique, which um, uh, certainly may prevent radial ulnar convergence and I think is a, uh, has a role and is an improvement on historical techniques. Um, may still have issues including uh, ulnar stump instability in the lower dorsal plane, as well as uh, potential issues with durability of the uh, tendon interposition. How about ulnar head arthroplasty? I think this is a step in the right direction in allowing uh, load bearing through the anatomic site of the DRUJ, but as this excellent series from the other Rochester points out, it has a lot of issues, including loosening, instability, uh, sigmoid notch arthrosis, leading to a high revision rate. Calamari arthroplasty, this is another uh, thing that you can do to help address the uh, sigmoid notch imparting uh, stabilization as well as interpos interposition, but I think it's fair to say that the data on this is extremely limited to a, a single case study in a case series. Short-term follow-up, um, they highlight stiffness as well as there's a lot of questions remaining, including uh, what implant to use, and I think it's fair to question what is the long-term durability of this procedure. So enter the semi-constrained DOUJ arthroplasty. Um, we're going to be focusing on this design, the aptus arthroplasty as designed by Dr. Shucker. It's a semi-constrained sliding ball and socket joint between a radial plate and an ulnar stem. It has a lot of advantages. It doesn't rely on soft tissues for stability. It's uh, versatile in a wide variety of anatomy. Uh, it doesn't depend on um, the ulnar variants, and it's uh, useful in a, a wide variety of indications, both in primary or a salvage um, situation, which is more commonly employed at our institution. Indications, probably the strongest indication for this is DRUJ arthritis with instability, either rheumatoid osteoarthritis or post-traumatic, but also very useful um, for salvage and failed reconstructions, either uh, resection arthroplasties or other prosthetic arthroplasties. It also has been described as a useful salvage in a wide variety of other indications, both congenital, post-traumatic, or post-surgical. So a few technical points to uh, uh, be successful with this. It is certainly a technically demanding procedure. Um, important to raise an ulnarly based retinacular flap uh, to cover the prosthesis at the end, as well as protect the ulnar sensory nerve on your way in. Carefully position your implants. Um, take your time to take off the volar lip of the sigmoid notch to allow for parallel positioning of the radial plate uh, in both planes. And then careful selection of implant sizing. You want to be careful to not have a prominent radial peg. Keep that inside the distal radius. Consider using a unicortical screw proximally to prevent um, a stress riser, which may lead to fracture. And then on your way out, carefully close using that, uh, using the interposition of that adipofacial uh, retinacular flap that was raised to start the procedure. So how do these patients do? So broadly speaking in the literature, this systematic review says they do very well. So um, 14 papers showing high satisfaction rates, good range of motion, good functional scores, despite, uh, and despite a um, admittedly high complication rate of 28% when pooled, um, very acceptable implant survival of 97% at medium term follow-up. Focusing on some other indications, this uh, series from Dr. Shecker and his group in high demand patients who, uh, under 40, years old, average age of 32 with 27 manual laborers, and almost all of them were able to return to work. Again, a high reoperation rate, though they um, discussed that a large amount of these were due to ECU tendonitis, which they said was uh, inversely correlated to using that um, retinacular flap, as I described. And again, consistent theme here is that you have good implant survival in the mid-90s at medium-term follow-up. Um, this paper previously brought up, but uh, it's a very useful procedure in salvage roles, in this case, uh, focusing on salvaging allograft interposition patients um, who had excellent uh, functional and pain improvement after using a DRUJ arthroplasty, 100% patient satisfaction. I want to highlight that the high rate 3.3 surgeries prior to DRUJ arthroplasty, which I think may be attributable to some of the high complications rates in the literature. Focusing on some of those complication rates, this series out of Mayo, um, focusing on the soft tissue complications, noting that uh, wound healing complications are common, but they tend to be um, successfully non-operatively managed. And then a lot of the other complications tend to be for extensor tendinopathy, um, which can be successfully treated um, often with soft tissue interposition between the prosthesis and the uh, extensor tendons. And they note that none of these complications happen in um, patients who had not had prior risk surgery. So there may be a suggestion that patients may, be do, may do well with this as a primary procedure. Possibly the most uh, pessimistic series in the literature is this uh, study out of Seattle from Dr. Hanel and Partners, um, 52 arthroplasties, 
uh, short-term following up showing a high complication rate and a high rate of major complications, um, although 96% were able to maintain a DUJ arthroplasty uh, at final follow-up. And I think they importantly discussed that uh, their complications decreased with time, and this is certainly a procedure with a learning curve. So hopefully we can learn from some of their technical points here. Um, as mentioned previously, considering uh, unicortical proximal screw, get patients er moving early, um, careful soft tissue handling and using a retinacular interposition for, to protect the extensors, and then careful patient selection. These patients can do very well, and in a high demand uh, patient or a patient with coexisting elbow pathology, you may uncover some overuse pathology. So back to our patient, um, this was a patient with uh, post-traumatic DRUJ arthritis. Um, she was initially treated with unipolar DRUJ arthroplasty, but predictably developed painful sigmoid notch erosion um, and was converted to an aptus DRUJ arthroplasty. You can see here intraoperatively placing the um, components, closing it with soft tissue interposition under the extensor tendons. And she has a stable radiographic uh, appearance at four-year follow-up with excellent uh, pain relief, good range of motion, and excellent function. So in conclusion, the DRUJ arthroplasty reconstructs you essential functions of the DRUJ in an anatomic manner. It's versatile. It can be used in primary or salvage uh, procedures and has broad indications. It is technique dependent and has a potentially high complication and reoperation rate, so, though some of those may be preventable. So this is maybe not for every situation and the indications we're still kind of learning from the literature, but it offers reliable improvement in pain, strength, range of motion, and uh, patient-reported outcomes with consistently high survivorship and at least a medium-term follow-up. Um, so thank you uh, from the sometimes sunny Rochester. So I want to thank Dr. Hammert and the rest of the faculty here. Well, thank you, Leland. That's an excellent review. Um, these were wonderful talks and they were really well put together. I, I do appreciate that. Um, I have a few questions and uh, let's see if we can share this with you, with all of us. All right, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay, perfect. Let's see if I can make this actually happen. So a bigger screen there. Okay, great. This is a, uh, that's Mount Baker in the background. That's the river is called the Skagit River. And this may be the last time that I am allowed to fish with steelhead on this river because uh, the impending extinction of steelhead, uh, steelhead on uh, the rivers that flow into the Puget Sound and out of the Puget Sound. So on that point, here's a question that I have, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Yao to answer this first and we'll just go down the list. So you're doing a soft tissue reconstruction for dorsal subluxation of the ulnar head relative to the radius and an otherwise normal destroyed ulnar joint. When you're doing your, your soft tissue reconstructions, do you position the wrist or the forearm in any particular position while you're doing that repair? Do you put it into supination, into neutral, into pronation? And, and does it really matter? So Jeff, can you answer that for us? Thanks, Doug. Um, great question. Um, you know, as you alluded to, uh, in, in most scenarios, the disradial joint is most stable in supination. Um, that being said, these reconstructions, and I prefer the uh, Ber uh, Adams Berger uh, reconstruction as demonstrated in the middle photo. Uh, this is not a truly anatomic reconstruction, meaning that as you pointed out in your initial discussion, this is just a one, this is just recreating basically one limb of the uh, of the um, of the TFCC or one portion, the deep portion, which is arguably the most important for stability. So, uh, long answer to a sh short question, but I um, have seen situations where uh, the the reconstruction is placed too tight in supination, and actually we had to uh, revise it. So I like to put it just in straight neutral. I find that um, that the patients are able to re, uh, recreate the pronation and supination from neutral position, but it's difficult to achieve full pronation if you put them in supination, it's, and it's difficult to achieve supination if, if you put them into full pronation. So do any of the other panelists disagree with that? 
I, I do. don't disagree with him. I do. I will put them in slight pronation when I do it because that's where the DRUJ tends to be unstable. And so I will, you know, maybe go 40 degrees or so of pronation as I'm tightening and putting the uh, tenon around the ulna. I do the uh, Adamsberger repair as Jeff had just talked about as well. But I think a little bit of pronation is helpful from my standpoint just because the, that's where the DRUJ is most unstable. Lewis, what do you, you, you disagree with that? Well, the, the thing is uh, uh, a ligament to work need to be short and tight. A ligament or the length of the, of the Adam procedure is not really a ligament reconstruction. And the idea that we have crisscross, that's not true. Because do you mind if I, if I show you just four slides? Sure. Okay. You have four slides. I have, have yeah, let me get you four slides here, okay? All right. Oh, what do you say? No, uh, sorry, someone need to me. help me. Someone need to help me to, to, to do this one. Um, sorry. I don't know if you can, can you see this one okay there? Yeah. Okay. This is a paper that shows that uh, that is a, Jim Botan and Jin Shu. And they did analyzing by imaging the tension of those ligaments. And that's the, the biggest thing that, you know, I'm just a countryside doctor. I don't understand things like that. So let's go <laughs> a little bit to, because the, the, the shorter distance between two points is the straight line that joined them. Okay? So let's see now and see a paper. This gentleman is a fantastic guy. He is a uh, now is a great hand surgeon, but as a re resident, he did a study of the cinematography of DIUJ. So let's put some dots on the, the phobia and let's put some dot on the dorsal in the palmar ligament, okay? A blue dot, okay? Now, how can any ligament that look in the, in the, in the lower corner, uh, look in the lower corner around here uh, to the right, when the two points get closer, how can the ligament be tight in that area? That is uh, uh, out of my, uh, uh, somebody's mind. And that is in full pronation. In full supination, the two ligaments are further apart, the two points are further apart. And that is when the, dos, the palmar ligament is tight in supination. When we go back again to pronation, look how they get closer there. If we go then uh, put red dot for the, the dorsal ligament, in supination, they are close. In pronation, they are separated. And that applies for the phobia as well as apply to the ligament that it they will be attached to the, uh, to the, uh, they will be attached to the styloid. So anyway, uh, with this thing, I, I want to stop, a stop, uh, how do I stop, a stop share and yeah. go back. So uh, the first thing we need to know is what we're talking about. That's in a crisscross. You put someone in pronation and you can elevate the radius dorsally. What you, can, what you cannot do is move the, the, the ulna dorsally. The other thing is the radius is the appendix of the, of the ulna. The only important, the only a, a safe part and a stable part in the whole forearm is the ulna. How are we going to do a procedure, whatever we do, and take uh, a, a tendon that insert in the hand to stabilize the ulna, that is the axis, is the, 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 the sun, the sun is the ulna and the, the, the radius is earth rotating around it. So that is it. I'm not, I'm not going to say any about anything else. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna ask the rest of the panel. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Jeff, what position do you put your, we're going to do a dorsal repair or for dorsal subluxation, what, degree of, uh, of rotation do you repair your distal radial ulnar joint in? So, so before I answer the question, I just want to make a comment about ligament reconstruction. Because, I mean, I was, when, um, you know, when, when uh, Brian first came out with this, uh, you know, uh, uh, complicated, uh, uh, you know, re reconstruction, it was, it was kind of exciting to see that there was, 
a, a technique that you could use to reconstruct both the volar and dorsal, you know, for a, for a situation where you have global instability. I'm just going to say, and, and I, I don't know if my experience is different from others, that the majority of the time, as long as there's not an extrinsic cause like a malunion, that, um, that I have been faced with distal radial joint instability, and we're talking about the non-arthritic condition, because that's when you do a ligament reconstruction most of the time, the TFC is still is usually still reconstructable. And in the majority of times, I have not had to do, and I've done Louis' dorsal reconstruction and I've done Brian's reconstruction, but I would say it's probably been in the range of more than 90% of the time, unless somebody's had you know, multiple ablative procedures on the TFC, the majority of the time there's good tissue there that can, that can, that can be reinserted back to the fovea. Now that said, when I'm faced with a uh, ligament reconstruction, I, I treat my ligament re reconstructions th with the exact kind of logic that I apply to my tendon transfers. And I kind of, I figure out in the situation where the instability is and what position the ligament is, the, is tight in. And I put the ligament tight uh, I position the wrist in the, in the position where it's going to be tight, and that's how I judge my tension. But of course, after I complete the reconstruction, I make sure that we're still able to achieve, you know, full passive motion with no um, abnormal uh, dorsal or palm or translation, because that's going to lead to premature arthritis. So that's kind of my two cents. Hey, Doug. Yeah. One thing I want to add that I think is really important that Jeff kind of alluded to is any of these soft tissue reconstructions or any of the implant reconstructions are going to fail if you don't have normal alignment of the DRUJ. So if there's a previous radius malunion, and a lot of times these will present that the patient had a fracture of the form when they were a teenager, you know, a 10, 12 year old teenager, and then 10 years later, they have kind of mild instability. And I think you really need to look at that with form x-rays and occasionally CT scans because an implant or a soft tissue reconstruction is gonna fail if the bony alignment is not right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Doug, what's your answer to that, to your question? My answer to my question is I put everything in 60 degrees of supination <laughs> because that's the isometric point of a joint and I tighten everything down trying to hold it in 60 degrees of supination. So that's, that's so my- I'm glad we've made this completely clear for the fellows on the call. <laughs> I, you know, of course, it, it, that's exactly right. So, and that's why we're doing that, so. Can, Doug, you, can I just say something else that, it, that kind of echo, echoes yeah. what, I mean, if you, if, if you look historically at the tendon transfers to, um, you know, to stabilize the, the ulna, there's, I don't know, probably 20 variations of ECU and FCU coming from the hand. And uh, the reports are always that it prevents your dorsal palmar translation. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Shecker. I mean, th those make absolutely no sense to me. And even though, you know, when I was a fellow, I wrote that project up with Bill Kleinman about the super DARA. Um, I haven't done a ECU or FCU tenodesis in probably, you know, 18 years. Great. Uh, great. Can you see my screen? Yep. See that slide that says in the setting of ulnar impingement, do you always yep. perform arthroscopy and yep. or ulnar shortening? Yeah. Jeff, why don't you take that one? From Greenberg. So this is, um, so your, your, your question is impingement, but you mean impaction, right? I do. I'm sorry. Ulnar impaction. So my answer is that I always do arthroscopy. And the reason I do arthroscopy is not because I think it, not, not because I think it really makes a difference as far as to what I'm going to be doing, but especially in cases like this, which are, which in this particular case, there's really significant um, ulnar positivity, but um, I'm always looking for a potentially unstable chondral lesion at the volar ulnar aspect of the lunate. 
And I think that I think that that represents a potential um, loose body. I don't think they they heal. And I have done arthroscopy on these patients with impaction and have found relatively large, just free chondral fragments that 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 have not shown up on um, on other imaging. Uh, so um, so the answer to the question is yes. Okay, so Jeff, do you do it before you do your shortening or after you do your shortening? Um, it's hard to do it before your shortening, uh, just because there's hardly there's there's very little spa working space there. So I usually do my um, my ulnar shortening first, and then do the arthroscopy. Now I'll qualify that because um, that's the order that I use if I do a diaphyseal ulnar shortening with a plate. Um, we didn't talk about the distal metaphyseal ulnar shortening, which Warren, you know, uh, has used, and I actually use that for my idiopathic ulnar impaction patients as well. In that situation, I do my arthroscopy first because uh, you need to do an arthrotomy when you do a distal metaphyseal, and I'm not a dry arthroscopy guy, so if you have an arthrotomy, it's hard to contain fluid. Great. Does anybody else in the panel have anything to add to that? I would say that uh, I um, do the opposite. I'll, I'll scope <laughs> first uh, because uh, obviously in this scenario, the image you're showing, it's pretty dramatic, the only positive variance, but often you'll get a scenario where your positive variance is two millimeters or three millimeters, not severe. Your MRI uh, doesn't show only impaction lesions. And so I do think that there's a reasonable option to go in there with the arthroscope first and address whatever ever pathology you see there and, and potentially not even do the ulnar shortening osteotomy if, there, if the impaction is not severe. Uh, we wrote up a small series of patients that, um, with, that we treated with microfracture in that scenario and uh, avoided the ulnar shortening altogether. Um, Jeff so Yao, can you give me a number, three millimeters? Four millimeters. This obviously is a five millimeter ulnar plus variant. When when you're going to do that, just as a scope alone, is this in a neutral variant or is it how it be, positive can it be? It could be two or three or four millimeters positive as long as there's no chondral injury to the lunate or triquetrum. Um, I I don't think you necessarily have to go right to the ulnar shortening osteotomy. In fact, I think Dave Roosh published uh, a good paper on that as well. Uh, I always start with the arthroscopy. Uh, now, now, granted, if you go in there and you see your chondral lesions, you see a uh, gross impaction, you see a completely torn central TFCC tear, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, ulnar head, uh, a loss of chondral bone, uh, uh, a loss of cartilage as well, then I think it's a no brainer you do an ulnar shortening osteotomy. But I'm just talking about in the, in the sort of the tweener situation where it's only positive, but you go in there and the pathology is not as bad as you think. I think certainly arthroscopic management has been shown uh, to be uh, acceptable with the understanding that you may have to go back to doing ulnar shortening uh, later as long as the patient understands that. Okay, great. Anybody else have anything to add to this question? Yes, uh, personally, I don't uh, really do wrist arthroscopy together with under shortening. I always go ahead and go straight for under shortening. Unless there any pathology cannot be explained purely by the honor uh, infection. But nowadays, uh, the, I think the MRI is pretty sensitive, pretty reliable. So I don't use arthroscopy as a diagnostic tool as much as I used to anymore, unless there's something else I need to fix. So uh, for this particular case, if it's a, the symptoms are purely on an in, impaction, I would just go straight for on the shortening and then go from there. Yeah, you know, it, it's very interesting that, you know, we've had nine of these or 10 of these, and that's, we, we had two camps when we talked about wrist arthroscopy and one followed your, your philosophy, Huey and everybody else followed uh, Jeff Yao's. And so it was a true 50-50 when we had that meeting. Um, relative to arthroscopy. And so uh, it still is a, is a toss up. I, I think that it's very interesting. I'm not a very good arthroscopist, but, um, and, and to that end, I will do my shortening before I do arthroscopy. So that's my answer to it. How about this? Um, Huey, what do, what do you think? Does the sigmoid notch, is there a reason to ever do a sigmoid notch plasty 
um, knowing what we know now. So, uh, I would say it's fun to do that and also fun to show fellows to do that. But I really don't think it's really uh, necessary. To me, the bone contour is not that critical. That's my personal opinion. Short yeah, answer. I, and I, I think I have to agree with that. Does anybody have any, uh, any strong feelings about doing notch plasties or, or osteotomies, the sigmoid notch, to improve inclination or tilt in either the coronal or the uh, sagittal plane? The problem I, I, I found, uh, Douglas, is uh, how much bone can you take with a, with a, with a, a cartilage so that, that uh, is still, the cartilage is going to be still alive as having blood supply. And once you start bending there, the, 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 the contour most of the time will break and rather than being round, have an angle there. And that's a big of a problem. It's very be it's beautiful to do it in paper, but when you are doing it in a patient, it's very hard to do, very hard to do. And better to have a proper a stabilization because the patient with a flat, with a flat uh, sigmoid notch used to be stable before he had trauma, was a stable joint before he had a trauma. Yeah, they don't become, they don't I, become I, stable with age. Yeah, does anybody think otherwise? Does anybody okay. in the panel? do osteotomies anymore? No, I, I agree. I think this has no role in my, in my opinion. Uh, it looks great on paper, but Mark Ross showed um, in uh, the British Journal that, um, that the space of the bony uh, loss of inclination is, is made up by the cartilaginous uh, labrum, if you will. And so very much like the TFCC in an ulnar negative variant is much thicker uh, to make up the space, uh, the cartilage uh, and the reverse obliquity or the flat sigmoid notch makes up the uh, orientation and provides the stability, in my opinion. So I, I don't think there's any role for this. Uh, Doug, I think, you know, say, echoing with uh, what Dr. Shecker just said, I think um, in, in all these cases, you're, you, if you really take your time and do a thorough exam, I think you're usually able to elucidate the reason for the instability. And I personally have never done a notch plasty. Yeah, I, I did a couple about 10, 15 years ago and, and, and followed the philosophy that it was normal before. It it's, should be normal again, especially if there's good cartilage left in place. So I've done the, you know, the, 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 only thing, the only thing you really could argue is that if uh -huh. there's, if there's, um, you know, a uh, malunion or, you know, a, a um, uh, you know, an ulnar sided fragment that has been malunited, that would make you think that the morphology of the notch was different. And that, in that situation, you might consider it, but usually you're treating the malunion there as opposed to treating the, and the malunion correct, the malunion correction corrects the instability as opposed to just performing an isolated notch plasty. Or if we look at the, the four lenses of that of the uh, Kakar Garcia Elias algorithm, yeah, you, know, you, you do your osteotomy that changes the uh, the ost changes the uh, or rearranges the the articulation, and then you really do have to assess the stability of that distal radial ulnar joint and do your repair. And if you're smart enough, as in Mark or as in Marco Rizzo, you've identified beforehand that you're going to have to repair or do a repair on the triangular fiber cartilage complex and dorsal, uh, dorsal ligaments in that setting. So the next question that I have is, um, and, and this is a mea culpa, this is my patient. So I'm the senior partner, I may send you a patient for your opinion. She's a 21-year-old woman who has had successful treatment of her Madeline's deformity. I did this procedure when she was 15. And I combined it with a inner position as in Greenberg Securianos. And she comes in for her biannual or her annual x-ray and she's doing great. And she's a D1 ball player. And I get this x-ray and every time I see it, I cringe. 
So, you know, what should I be, what, what, what are you going to do with this lady, Dr. Ian Uzi? She's going to be yours in probably about four years when I retire. So what are you going to say, Nick? I mean, it's a, you know, this is a difficult problem. And I think this is the, the crux of what we are talking about tonight and why we have so many options. And I think, um, you know, one of our fellows in a recent paper wrote, you know, we have to change the, or trade the potential complications and the, the, the true downsides of each operation and tailor those to each patient. Um, I certainly hope this person doesn't play goalie. Like I wouldn't want her taking a ball to the hand every, uh, every game. She's but, midfield. She's a midfield. Yeah. You know, and so it, she's a 21 year old female. So what I, I'm basically going to say is that you have good function if you're playing now and we're going to have to figure out what your next procedure might be because um, this may last her entire life, but if it doesn't, uh, the, the real question is what are we going to do next? And, you know, the, the couple of outs that I have found in, in any of these procedures uh, have been the procedure described by Dr. Sirtirianos and Dr. Greenberg, and then also uh, a Schecker arthroplasty. Um, I think, you know, we have a couple procedures that are potentially up and coming and um, don't take away future options. I think those are the strengths of the ulnar shortening osteotomy and the calamari procedure. Um, and, and just kind of keeping as many options open for the future is just, uh, is, is the key in the way that I try to approach these problems. All right. No, Jeff, can I, Jeff can I make a comment about this? Pardon? Because, I mean, there's, there's, there's two things going on here, I think, that you probably, when you look at the x-ray, you probably get concerned. And one is that uh, scalloping of the ulna and I mean, you could just, you know, imagine that you're, you're in a position is just sitting there between the radius and the ulna and that scalloping, you know, is just the accommodation of the graph. The, the thing that, that worries me more than that is what's going on on the proximal drill hole of the radius. And honestly, if, the per, if she was completely asymptomatic, I mean, I really wouldn't be worried. But one thing that I wouldn't want to do is just let, let her be lost to follow up. I might even consider at this point in time, getting a CT scan of her radius, just to get a baseline quantification of the size of that defect, and then maybe see her on an annual basis and just get another CT scan. Because the thing that would worry me that the ulnar scalloping doesn't worry me at all. We see that all the time. But if that radial lesion is getting, would be getting larger because there's a suture or something that's toggling, that puts her at a great risk for a radial, uh, a, a metaphyse, you know, proximal metaphyseal fracture. And that's what I'd be worried about. But in general, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't be too worried about this patient. Yeah, I mean, she's pain free, and, and I think that 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 does represent a uh, the the tail end of a suture anchor person that's causing that. And yeah. if she started to develop pain, I, I would really have no compunction with prophylactically plating her. You know, early. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to deal with it. That's a thought. Cool. So. We have, uh, it's, now we have one minute left. And I'm gonna go to this slide right here. Okay. In all of the procedures that we've discussed, all of those that actually that I thought were, that were discussed, the most successful procedures at their very most have a four to six percent failure rate, outright failure rate. So Jeff Yao, in your procedure, if you've got a failed Salve Kapunji, just tell me, what's your go-to procedure next to salvage that? Uh, yeah, great question. And, and I, that's the crux of this all. There, none of these procedures is fail safe. And I think that's important for everybody to walk away with that is that uh, all these procedures have merit and we're not here to say that one is any better than the other, but um, they all have their uh, potential issues and we have to be prepared to address that. Asave Kapanji in my hands uh, works very well uh, but there is uh, no doubt that there's the possibility of proximal stump uh, impingement and instability. 
Um, unlike Jeff Greenberg, I do still uh, like to do some tendon uh, 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 stabilizations of the proximal stump. I use the ECU, but I also uh, interpose the pronated quadratus between the radius and ulna uh, to help act as an interposition as well as act as a depressor of the ulna. Uh, now, if that fails, uh, which it has, uh, even in my cases as well, then I will uh, go to a um, uh, allograft interposition as described by Jeff and Dean. And that's been a very good salvage uh, for the few uh, of the SKs that have failed uh, due to that reason. Uh, I haven't had any other issues with non-union or anything like that. Okay. Hey, Jeff Greenberg, that my midfielder gets involved in a bit of a scrum, breaks that scallop distal ulna. How are you going to treat that? Um, I, I would treat her distal radius fracture and just put a plate on it. Okay, that's a distal radius fracture. But what about the, the about her ulna? Have you had a, have you had any of these scalloped ulnas break yet? No, I was I was going to say I've never I've never faced that problem. I mean, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I treat that. I probably would just. I. I probably would just resect the distal broken part and leave the interposition alone. Yeah, I. Th I. I guess so. You know, and, you know, in Securianus's article, he had two scallops out of his, you know, fifty patients or whatever. I would say that more often than not, I. I've got some, some degree of scalloping when I do a Securianus procedure in young people, and. I, it's not under, I, this is not an undersized graph. This is, they, they all scallop a bit. And so, but I haven't had anyone break. So, so Lewis and Huey, when you guys, when you've done your owner shortening osteotomy and you've done your repair of your distal radio ulnar joint is, and that fails, are you going straight to a semi-constrained Arthroplasty, Lewis. Yes, I tend to do that. Um, we have had we, we analyzed at one time ninety-two cases of ulnar shortening, and we have two cases that um, we didn't think that the type three of uh, desmet. Uh, I mean, the the angle of the sigmoid notch was. Uh, from radial to ulna, uh, angled that way. I didn't think that was so bad, but when I did the ulna shortening, it increased the pressure. And after about two years, the patient needed to have you know, that replaced. I didn't want to do that immediately. Uh, she came initially to have the, the implant. I said, no, you are young. Let's, let's do ulna shortening, et cetera. And uh, it only lasted about two years because it, we increased the pressure. And that's also you need to be careful when we do on a shortening. In the tight three, be careful because you are going to uh, you are going to uh, increase the pressure on top of the head or the or the ulna, and that's going to damage the cartilage. So Nick Ianuzzi, what are you going to do when that calamari fails? It, or do you think it's going to fail, or when uh, you, I mean, you know, like everything fails eventually with enough time. Um, and so I wouldn't say it wouldn't fail, but the benefit is that you do have kind of whatever options available that you'd want to use. Um, you have the entire ulnar head. Uh, so it would depend on what the patient's activity level is. You know, I tend to, um, not try to perform shecker or constrained arthroplasties in, uh, younger patients because I'm concerned about the durability of metal and plastic. Um, will you, will you define younger? Yeah, under 40, probably, or if they're particularly active, um, you know, if they're a labor, uh, I might try to avoid that. Um, in that case, I might consider um, either revising it or consider a um, resection with interposition. Um, and you can always, as we've seen, bail out the interposition to a constrained arthroplasty if you want. Um, and so, you know, that's the one benefit of that procedure so far, even though there's not a, a significant track record of it, then there's still options uh, available. Okay. The only thing uh, may I jump in? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that, I, uh, Nick. Um, I've been working with Dr. Shaker in the same institute for more than 10 years. I would say probably including fellowship 20 years. Uh, if 
if after on the short run it failed, I really don't mind to do soft kapanji, but I have seen great success in this um, this institute and it has a high volume of success for uh, shaker prosthesis. I will not hesitate to go for prosthesis uh, shaker imprint. Even the young age, like this uh, Nick's definition, uh, 40 years old, I'm 61. Uh, I consider I'm kind of young. I, I'm active. I really have no problem putting uh, a shaker prosthesis. The reason is I physically witnessed a great success. So I, I, can, I believe my eyes and I feel I have no trouble uh, putting an imprint in. And this is my personal uh, feeling and experience. All right, so on that note, Warren, it just failed. How are you, what are you gonna do when your semi-constrained prosthesis fail? I guess the definite or the question is, what does the definition of failure mean? Is it a loose screw? Is it symptomatic uh, ECU tendonitis? Has the implant become infected? Uh, is the implant, you know, did the ulna break, did the radius break? And so there's a whole kind of slew of things that could go wrong. If I could salvage the implant, that would be my first choice. But if there's a problem where I couldn't salvage the implant, I would take it out. And there's, you know, if it's been, if there's been an infection, there's probably enough scarring that the uh, interosseous space has kind of been recreated. And I would consider putting an owl graft interposition in there. If it was grossly infected, I wouldn't put it in there. I would just take it out and see if it's scarred together. But my, my kind of thought is if it fails to the point the implant needs to come out, an owl graft interposition can be done just like you can go from a failed owl graft interposition to an implant. Okay. Now I'm going to just put in a pitch for anybody listening that puts in a semi-constrained arthroplasty. Our infections were in patients who had dental manipulation and no peri manipulation antibiotics. And the, the most memorable of which was a patient who had his implant in for seven years. Um, and he had a dental manipulation, a root canal, and um, arrived in the ER with an infected distal radial ulnar joint prosthesis, uh, the Shecker. Um, two weeks later. And so just know that, treat these like total, these are real total joints and the, your patients need to know that they should probably be on, pro, on antibiotic prophylaxis when they're having dental man manipulation or other any other medical manipulation that will lead to a, a big bolus of bacteria. So, well, you guys, it is 6.40 and it's, on the East Coast, it's it's May being bedtime for everybody that was up last night. Um, here on the West Coast, it's a beautiful evening in Seattle. The sun's going to set in about two or three hours. And uh, I really do appreciate all the hard work that went into this discussion and these presentations. Uh, you guys make us proud. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be a hand surgeon looking at who is going to be the next generation of hand surgeons and uh, and professors. So thank you very much. I'll leave us all on that note. Goodbye and good night. Thanks, thank Doug. You all. Thank you very thank much. You all. Take care. Take care. All right. Bye -bye. Great job to all the fellows. Thank you.